Hello and welcome back. OK, quick recap. In the first video, we built the simplest VGA circuit I can imagine, which is basically just bit banging an output register. In the second video, we offloaded some of that work by adding a sync generation circuit, but we were still outputting the color data manually. In the third video, we added a frame buffer, and that was the first time we had a properly independent VGA circuit that could run on its own. And that freed up everything enough to start doing some interesting stuff. And we finished that video with some animation. And because I've said that my kind of goal for this whole kind of combined set of projects is to be able to develop some games, that's really where things are starting to get interesting. So in this video, I'd like to talk about and explore the circuitry to implement one of the staple animation technologies in 8-bit graphics era, and that's hardware scrolling. So let's start talking about that. OK, so before the start of this video, I did upload a image of a parrot. That's working quite nicely. But we do have this little issue where we have to offset the data by a couple of pixels horizontally and a few more pixels vertically in order to get it in the right place on screen. And in the last video, we did talk about ways of solving that. Now, for the X coordinate, the horizontal, that's these three counter chips here. And we are resetting them to zero on this line, which is the horizontal sync. And then there's a, a small delay before we start actually outputting pixels, and that's the horizontal offset. So I did mention that one way to solve this would be to use the parallel load. Now that's a feature on these chips that allows us to initialize it to a specific value instead of initializing it to zero using the reset line. Now these parallel load lines, I've pulled them high on all of these. Let's actually cross connect them. So at the moment, the horizontal sync is going to the reset. Let's take that off. That was the increment I moved. That's the reset. Okay, so if I just feed that into the parallel load instead, probably going to go a bit wrong because there's nothing on those lines. OK, so we've got a funny offset. I imagine for the most part, these lines are getting pulled high by pull-up resistors on the inputs. Let's see what happens if I uh, modify those lines. I keep meaning to make a PCB version of this board. So there, we change the initialization value for these counters, and we get a different offset. We've got a bunch of floating inputs here, so it's going to be uh, non-ideal. So in actual fact, if we have a means of programmatically controlling these 12 bits of input, which are the preload values for these three counters, we could control the horizontal position of the image and affect scrolling. Now our frame buffer has got 80 pixels wide that we display and 128 pixels wide in the actual memory because we take seven bits from here and use it as seven bits in the address to the memory. So what we need is a data source for that. And the obvious thing is we want some latches to store it in. So I'm going to need some more space here. Got some more breadboards. I can remove one strip. I know some people prefer to keep the strips doubled up, but um, I'm just so short of space here. Now, I think we're about to hit peak plausible breadboard for this. Need the values here and the smallest set of wires is at the counter stage. So there's what four wires are actually cross here apart from power. Need longer wires for some of these. That's the master clock into the X position. Uh, that's not long enough. This one's longer, which I've just borrowed from uh, memory data is no longer long enough. Now I need to extend power up and ground. P 
appear to be missing pull up on the enable line here. It would have probably floated higher, which is why the circuit worked before. I'll have to check the other video and see if I missed that out right. Okay, so now what we need is a set of latch chips. Now, for both X and Y, the counters are 12 bits because we've got three 4-bit counters. But it's actually only 10 bits and 9 bits that are actually significant. So in theory, we could use three latch chips at 8 bits a piece and have the lower eight bits of each in one and then the upper bits spread around the other. But that's actually going to be a bit of a pain to program. I think what we actually want is two 8-bit registers for the horizontal and two 8-bit registers for the vertical. So these are 74LS574. So all of the inputs are going to come from a bus of some kind. Ground. We're going to want to force the output enable low. Okay, so we've got the eight inputs for each of these along the bottom, and I want to tie all of those together. That's the two pairs at the sides done. Okay, so now we want to do something with the outputs. So you've got 10 bits here and 9 bits here that are relevant at the moment. I think I'd have been lynched if I went for uh, two more breadboards without any LEDs. So these bar graphs are 10 LEDs. So for once we're actually going to use them. The resistor arrays are only 8. So we're going to get some 4s in at the end. Just need to connect all the outputs to the LEDs. And then the same for the vertical. Right, so previously, when we've been building peripherals for the CPU, when we've had registers like this that we're going to use as control in those peripherals, we've connected the load line to the load for one of the I.O. ports, and then we just connect these inputs to the main bus, and then the appropriate instruction will uh, pull data into it. But on the audio device, we had to do something different than that because we, we ran out of I.O. ports. We only had um, a few spare, and we used one for the audio and set up a complicated arrangement for getting multiple registers loaded from uh, one load line. I may revisit that one a little bit in, in the future. But here we've got four registers and we've got one I.O. port spare that we've devoted to the, the VGA. And that's not enough. And I really don't want to mess around with complicated schemas for, for loading. So we need to look at a different way of handling those registers. And for that, we're going to do some memory mapped I.O. Now, by my count, I think it's nine registers I'm going to need for the VGA once I'm all done with all the features I'm going to put in. So we're going to need a, a sequence of addresses in memory, which are going to actually be represented by the latch chips here and the additional ones we'll add later. So we need a bus connection into here, but we also need to find a way of driving the load lines on these latch chips somehow from the memory write line and the address lines. First and obvious step for that is to differentiate these. So I'm going to use a, a 3 to 8 line decoder. Now we're going to end up with a couple of these chained together. So that's four out of 16 address lines covered. Let's start by connecting the outputs from the decoder to the load lines on the latch chips. That's an easy one. That's cool. Okay, so there is a active high enable. 
there's an active low enable and there's one more active low enable which we're going to treat as one of the address lines for the purposes of chaining two of these together. Okay, so let's talk about how we do the rest of the interfacing to create the memory mapped I.O. Okay, the first thing to probably cover is what is memory mapped I.O.? The simple explanation for that is we replace dedicated I.O. ports with memory read and writes to specific addresses. It does have some advantages both to us in this build and generally. It requires no extra hardware in the CPU or indeed lines coming out of the CPU. This is obviously why a lot of low cost microprocessors chose to use this as their primary I.O. system. And you've got lots of addresses. So you're not really constrained on the number of I.O. ports you have. You could use the majority of the address range if you wanted to. And it obviously comes with some disadvantages as well. It's often slower, although that is dependent on the processor's architecture. In the case of my CPU, the I.O. instructions are a single cycle, but memory read and writes are essentially two cycles because they block the memory bus from being used by the fetch unit. And it uses some address space. So we've already got quite a constrained amount of memory, 64 kilobytes, and we're going to use some of that just for I.O. operations. So now it's worth talking about the address map. So we've got 64 kilobytes of memory, and at the top of that is a region I've reserved for the bootloader and the stack. Now at the moment, no programs used anything like 8 kilobytes, and it's obviously an option for any program to overwrite the bootloader if it needs the extra memory, but um, I'm not trying to lay down any hardware logic that precludes that uh, 8 kilobytes being available for that purpose. Now in the third VGA video, we created a frame buffer, and that's also 8 kilobytes, and we've stuck that immediately under there. And then we kind of get into some memory regions that are for planned for functionality, but not yet built. There's an 8 kilobyte region for tile data, 4 kilobyte region for sprite data, and 1 kilobyte I've reserved for palette data. And then beneath that, I've picked out a 256 byte region for memory mapped I.O. So the first of our I.O. ports is going to go at the very bottom of that range, and then the following three in sequential addresses after it. So finally, it's worth talking about how we're going to do that. So it's worth a reminder of our memory signals. This is what a write operation looks like, and I'm not particularly interested in reads. So for the time being, I'm only ever going to support outputs using memory mapped I.O. Although the circuitry would be very similar to go the other way. So within a cycle where a memory write is happening, we try and get the address onto the address bus pretty much immediately. Whatever's writing to the memory region will push its data onto the main bus. Mem bridge direction goes low, which will cause the memory bridge to push that data onto the memory data bus. And then the load line for memory goes low for the first half of that cycle. And really it's this line we're interested in happening. At the rising edge of this signal is when we expect to be able to read the data in. So we've got the first half of the cycle to select our latch chip based on the contents of the address bus. And because this is a 256 byte region, we're always going to expect these first eight bits to be the same. We've already wired in the first of a pair of 74LS 138s. So this is going to be accessing the bottom four bits. And so we need to drive the enable line on this pair of demultiplexers using an appropriate signal based off the upper 12 bits. Now this is going to be one of the rare occasions where I deliberately do something different on the breadboards than I'm going to do on a PCB. Now regular viewers of my CPU series can probably immediately see several different ways we could create a control signal that explicitly requires this address to activate it. We could use some combinatorial logic to do it directly. We could use a few of these um, 138 demultiplexers or one of the other demultiplexer chips to cascade the selection of these lines. Or we could even do it with some inverters and a number of diodes. What I'm going to do is complete the rest of the circuit that is going to be on the same PCB and see what gates I've got left over and, uh, and see what solution I can come up with the, for the lowest chip count. 
For now, we just want to approximate this address range. If we ignore some bits, we're just going to end up replicating these IO ports at different memory locations, but we've got some spare space at the moment before we develop the next chunks of circuit. So I'm not too worried about that. I'd rather save a bit of breadboard space and time now. So it's worth remembering that we already have a 138 decoding the top three lines of the address, which we use to pull out the frame buffer location. So we can take advantage of that, use the appropriate line from there and narrow it down to an eight kilobyte region. Then I'm gonna add one more 138, which I'll cascade off that. That will mean my IO ports end up filling out a 512 byte region of memory. We'll narrow that down further when we design the PCB, but for now it doesn't matter too much. Right, I've got that extra 138. Should uh, try and get that in. I'm gonna put it down here, but I'm gonna move the memory connections across slightly. Okay, let's get power and ground in. Right, now I need to grab the next four most significant lines below the three that we were already feeding into this 138. Okay, so I'm going to feed three of those into the address on that chip. I'm right, going to ignore that line for now. We could get away without it. We'll just be replicating these uh, registers an extra time. All right, now I want the right line to go into one of the active low enables. And the other active low enable needs to go into the appropriate line on this demultiplexer. So the top three bits of the memory address for the registers is 100. So that'll be line four. I've only got three lines in here at the moment, so that means the address we're hitting for the registers will be 010. So that's two. So we can replace that active low. So we've got the four address lines there. Need to come from the least significant four address lines from the address bus. Okay, I think that's everything we need to make the registers load. Okay, one last thing. We need the bus to go up to, well, we could plug it into any one of these four locations because we're copying it across. Let's try and set this register. So we can use the monitor here. So 8B00 should be the bottom eight bits here. Ah, that's cool. Let's try just setting the highest of those bits. That's cool. Yeah, seems fairly consistent. Set the next bit up. So it's in the second register. It's 8B01. Set to one. Try these ones. Yeah, that's good. All right, so now what we want to do is get this data down to the initialization inputs. These bits go left to right. Now let's get an image back in there. Okay, so it looks like there's a slightly corrupted form of the parrot in there still. The static RAM chips hit we're using here are remarkably stable with the power disconnected. So let's execute that and load the parrot. So that's cleaned up now. Now, in theory, we should be able to change the horizontal offset by poking these memory addresses. That's pretty cool. Okay, I think what we actually need to do now is give this a proper test by writing some code to animate the value we're loading into this register. Let's go take a look at that. Okay, so this is a quick test code I've knocked up. So this is initializing A and B to zero, treating that as a 16-bit value. And then we just loop through, waiting for the vertical blanking interval, and then storing that into the horizontal offset register. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, let's see what this does. That doesn't feel right, does it? Okay, that's my wait new VBL function doesn't seem to be working. Okay, let's try that again. Okay, we are seeing scrolling. There's some bits that aren't right there. Now some of the glitchiness, I imagine it's just slightly loose wiring, but the jerkiness of it is probably some bits swapped around. Okay, so that took a little while. What I discovered was that the 163 chips were not responding properly to the parallel load. If I took the clock for these from one of the channels on the clock divider for the sync circuit, then it all started working fine. But using the raw 25 megahertz output from this crystal, and it started to struggle, and there were periods of time when it just wasn't working right. And in the end, the thing that's made the difference is down here I've constructed little wires that go from the ground pin to right next to the power pin so I can put a decoupling capacitor as close to across those lines as possible. Ideally actually I would have had a few more of these sockets which uh, would have probably made the difference but uh, I only had a couple of those but this seems to have solved the problem. But let's go back and have a look at this now I can show it to you properly. So now we can see uh, perfectly smooth scrolling. Now this is actually updating at 60 frames a second, but you're only seeing it at 30. And there's a little bit of time aliasing in the capture that um, I don't see if I put this through a local monitor. But hopefully you can see that that is nice and smooth. Let's actually speed that up a little bit. So at the moment I'm incrementing it one pixel per clock. Let's actually change that to adding the contents of C. Let's go for 10 pixels at a time. Okay, we should be able to reset this and get back to the monitor. We never took power away, so the parrot's still going to be there. Okay, that's cool. We're seeing that 10 times faster. Now we can see the irregularity in the update I was talking about uh, a little bit clearer, but I believe that's a timing artifact between the VJ output and the capture device. I'll get the monitor out at some point and show you that with um, a, a direct video feed. Of course, now you can properly see that the red parrot we've been looking at before is just to the right of this yellow and green parrot. This is actually part of a larger image that's quite commonly used for testing graphics systems. Okay, so at any given point in time, we're showing 80 horizontal pixels out of a total of 128 that we can fit in the frame buffer. But that's not a great deal of scrolling. What we actually want to be able to do is update the off-screen contents there. So I'm going to spend a bit of time writing some demo code to kind of show off what, what we can actually achieve on, on this CPU and VGA combination. Okay, so I've spent a whole bunch of time coding a demo to showcase the horizontal scrolling. Probably much more time than I should have done. Let's take a look. Okay, so what I've tried to do here is blend a couple of rock textures to create this kind of uh, ongoing fractal cave structure. So you've got a background texture that's being tiled, a foreground texture that's being tiled, and now I'm cutting out of this with a drop shadow, a kind of procedurally generated cave structure. So you could really imagine this as being the beginnings of, uh, of a side-scrolling computer game. 
So imagine you've got like a little spaceship here that you're having to manoeuvre to uh, stay within the confines of the tunnel and not hit the edges. I'm really pleased with this. The two images are loaded as uh, data blobs and then the drop shadow is calculated on the fly. But of course what I'm doing here is I'm only actually filling in the area to the right of the screen that uh, is new to ready to be scrolled in. So all of this gets done well inside the vertical blanking interval. In the comments of the last video a few people were asking about double buffering and one of the things I was explaining in response was that um, in the 8-bit era it's much more common to do incremental updates to a, a single screen buffer. Now if I were to try and draw this fresh into a buffer each time I even on this CPU I wouldn't be able to maintain 60 frames per second even if the back buffer was a separately addressed region where I didn't have to worry about timing it with video access. So in this case incremental update means I'm only updating one or two columns of pixels on the right and I can produce this uh, fast animating smooth scrolling output which I'm really pleased with. Okay, so we've done these counter inputs now to control the horizontal scrolling and I think it's probably going to be fairly obvious what we're going to do over here to create the vertical scrolling. All right, so the parallel load here is being held high. So we'll move the end of frame. Oh, we've already got some more. Vertical scrolling unintentionally. Is that stable because we've got 60 vertical pixels and only 64 in the buffer? So if we plug this wire into the parallel load, it will restabilize. It's so now exactly the same as we did here. We're going to take the parallel inputs from these counters just from the outputs, this time of the second register set. This is all much lower frequency, so I'm hoping we won't run into the kind of problems we had before. I'm going to pull the unused inputs down. OK, so we've got zero in the register, and pretty much the parrot looks like it did when we were using the reset line. We should be able to test out this new vertical scroll capability just by poking values into the registers using the monitor. Now F0 is the hex decimal for 240, which is half the height of the screen. Ah, perfect. Let's just try one pixel. Yeah, that's working fine. OK, so I think what I'm probably going to do is write a little addendum to the side scrolling code to utilize the vertical scrolling register as well. OK, so what I've done is I've spent some time adding the vertical scroll capability into my procedural tunnel demo. The idea is I've made it so that the vertical scrolling tracks roughly the position of the tunnel on the left hand side of the screen. So let's give you a quick demo with that. I have to say I was really pleased with this, starting to just give me that feeling of a sideways scrolling game with, uh, and I can start to imagine a bit of action on here. So uh, that's pretty cool. We made a, a nice big step forward with, with this today, getting all of the hardware scrolling in. OK, so what I did here was I tracked the vertical position, but I average a few points along the terrain. And I also add a little bit of extra smoothing to it so that the scrolling stops being too jerky. So I'm really pleased with this and it, it demos the functionality really well. Well, I'm really pleased with the progress we've made today. This hardware scrolling is going to be a nice little tool to use along the way to making some nice computer games for this platform. I do have one small confession to make though. I had planned to go a bit further with this, 
but things took me a bit longer than expected and this video is already quite long. So the next video is actually going to be a continued exploration of some of the same concepts. Very much hope you found this interesting. As always, subscribe if you're interested, hit the like button and use that little notify button. And if you're interested, there's a link to the new Discord down in the description where there's quite a few people having uh, some quite entertaining conversations about this whole kind of problem space. I'll see you again soon. Goodbye.